the Kennedy Space Center in early July 1969. The Saturn V launcher for the Apollo 11 mission is taken from the vehicle assembly building using the crawler. This 2,700 ton crawler gear will take six hours to get the rocket to launching complex pad 39A. On the 16th of July 1969, everything is ready for takeoff. The crew, consisting of Neil Armstrong, Edwin Aldrin and Michael Collins are on their way to take their seats in the capsule. The giant Saturn V launcher, designed specifically for the Apollo missions, weighs 3,000 tonnes. It is the biggest launcher made to date. It is the first rocket to use oxygen and liquid hydrogen as a fuel. The first two stages are designed to send 140 tonnes into low Earth orbit. Standing 108 metres high, the equivalent of a 40 storey building, the Saturn V rocket is enough to make you dizzy. The firing of the rocket motors takes place 8 seconds before liftoff. When the thrust is sufficient, the rocket is released from the launching tower. It is 9.32 a.m. local time. The takeoff takes place in a deafening roar. The ground vibrates for several tens of kilometres around the site. More than one million people came to watch the takeoff line. It takes 12 seconds for the launcher to leave the tower. The reactor then develops a thrust of 3,400 tonnes and propels the rocket through the atmosphere. As it increases altitude, the rockets tilt and turn its trajectory. A cloud of condensation forms around the rocket as its speed approaches Mach 1, the speed of sound. After just a few minutes, and at an altitude of about 60 kilometres, the first stage is empty of fuel and is detached by means of explosive bolts. It will fall into the ocean. Meanwhile, the second stage reactors take over. The second stage propels the rocket to 24,600 km per hour, taking it to an altitude of 190 km. The rescue tower is then ejected and the second stage is also detached and falls back to Earth. The astronauts are now in space. To stabilise the orbit, the engine on the third stage is ignited and this accelerates the rocket to a speed of 5.8 kilometres per second. After two or three orbits, the translunar injection operation can begin. The third stage rocket is reignited and the astronauts undergo a significant acceleration to reach the escape velocity of 11.2 kilometres per second. Just under three hours from takeoff, the crew headed straight for the moon. Now the Apollo command module must be attached to the lunar excursion module, known as the LEM. The command module separates from the third stage and rotates through 180 degrees. The protective petals of the shell have opened and released the LEM. The pilot then manoeuvres the command module to ensure a smooth link-up with the LEM. That operation done, the entire Apollo ship is now ready for its lunar encounter. Another slight push from the rocket motor and the Earth-Moon journey begins. Meanwhile, the engine of the third stage is of no further use and it is fired at a distance to redirect it to the moon where it will crash a few days later. The Earth-Moon journey lasts four days, during which the astronauts are kept busy. Here we see Neil Armstrong experimenting with a small volume of water. Here they are orbiting the moon after decreasing their speed to be trapped by the lunar gravity at 100 km altitude. Aldrin and Armstrong join the lunar module through the access tunnel that connects it to the control module. The third astronaut, Michael Collins, remains in the control module. He will remain in orbit and await their return. The LEM is unhooked and descends to the surface of the moon. After taking a tour inspection of the moon's landing site, 
they use the central engine to slow their fall and land smoothly. Due to an alarm indicating memory saturation of the onboard computer, Neil Armstrong decides to exceed the selected landing site by 7 kilometers and approaches a crowded area of boulders. Armstrong took manual control of the lunar module okay, to fly over the terrain yeah, horizontally in search of a suitable landing site. The LEM is now very close to the ground and raises a cloud of dust that hinders visibility. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The calculations to verify that the module was ready for an emergency takeoff if the situation warranted took two hours. Armstrong and Aldrin then put on their spacesuits and start to depressurize the LEM. Neil Armstrong's speech was heard by hundreds of millions of viewers on Earth. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Magnificent desolation. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like m much of the high desert of uh, the United States. It's, uh, but it's very pretty out here. The astronauts had relatively little time to complete the scientific part of their mission. Aldrin deployed the SWC solar wind particle sensor, which was in the form of an aluminium sheet stretched by a shaft. Despite the firmness of the soil, Aldrin managed to plant the device vertically, directing the sheet towards the sun. Meanwhile, Armstrong unrolled and managed to plant the American flag in the ground. This act did not reflect a territorial claim, but was intended to mark the American victory in the space race engaged with the Soviet Union. Whilst Armstrong unpacked two small suitcases that are to be used to store lunar soil samples, Aldrin is carrying out a set of exercises to test his mobility on the surface of the moon. Aldrin takes several steps back and forth in front of the video camera. He did not feel any discomfort to move, but when he changed direction he had to take into account that the centre of gravity on his body was higher than on Earth. At 23.45 hours, Washington DC asked the astronauts to move into the field of one of the cameras for a telephone conversation with the President of the USA, Richard Nixon. Hello Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. The astronauts then resumed their work. While Armstrong quickly collected samples with his shovel, Aldrin performed a series of photographs and unloaded two scientific instruments. Aldrin set up the seismometer, whilst Armstrong joined him to set up a laser reflector, which must be orientated towards the Earth with an accuracy of 5 degrees. The seismometer equipment had to be perfectly horizontal, and its solar panels orientated towards the Sun. Between them they collected 21.7 kilograms of lunar rock, but the hard ground did not allow them to take a core sample. The astronauts returned to the LEM after spending 2 hours 31 minutes outside, where they had travelled just 250 metres. The takeoff from the moon took place on the fifth day of the mission. The astronauts now proceeded with the stowage whilst in lunar orbit. The crew were reunited again after a successful docking manoeuvre with the control module. 
The LEM is then jettisoned and will crash onto the lunar surface a few days later. After performing several more lunar orbits, the command module rocket is fired and the four day return trip to the Earth begins. Only a mid-course correction disturbs the monotony of the trip back to Earth. When they arrive back near Earth, the astronauts separate the service module and this will later disintegrate in the atmosphere. The control module is then orientated so that the thermal shields are facing towards the Earth. A very important parameter comes into play now, namely the angle of entry into the atmosphere. The margin of tolerance is a mere 2 degrees. If the angle is too direct, the speed will be too great and the command module will simply disintegrate in the atmosphere. If the angle is too shallow, the command module will bounce off the atmosphere and go back out into space. The command module enters the atmosphere at 40,000 km per hour. The astronauts then experience deceleration of more than 6 Gs. The friction of the air on the walls of the entry vehicle cause the temperature to rise to over 3,000 degrees Celsius. At an altitude of 3,000 meters, three parachutes open to slow the craft down. Finally, they splash down in the Pacific Ocean. Three huge balloons inflate to prevent the capsule from turning upside down. An American Navy ship arrives at the scene, having already sent helicopters in advance to secure the astronauts. Divers help the astronauts to get out of the command module and get them into the helicopter. They are then taken back to the ship and safety. The mission ends here after several intensive days for both the crew and the ground engineers. The heroes are cheered by the crowd during a grand parade in the streets of New York. <laughs>